All right. Hey, I need to introduce you guys. Uh, Taylor, come on up. Trevor. Um, this is uh, Trevor and Taylor ha Hager. 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 Um, and Finley. And Finley is nine months old. And uh, Trevor is joining us on staff as our new uh, worship and creative arts pastor. Uh, I just wanted to give him FaceTime. He's kind of, they've been here for a few weeks, kind of getting their uh, head on the ground, feet on the ground and everything, um, and kind of get the lay of the land of how this goes. Um, Trevor's been doing a conference a couple weeks ago, so he wasn't here on Sunday, and then he's leaving with me to go to Ethiopia uh, next Monday. So I just said, hey, uh, grateful for Darren and Crystal Libby filling in, uh, worship leading up here. Uh, they've been here two weeks now, and they'll be here for the next two. But I want to introduce you to um, who's going to be leading us forward um, just grateful for their leadership, uh, grateful for how God has crossed our paths, and really looking forward to seeing you guys come alive here. All right, so take it away. Well, I'm Trevor, and uh, we're honored to be here. We're humbled, excited for the future of what God has in store here at Venture Church, and um, we're just looking forward to what's going to come of this. And I just want to encourage you, if you're here and you would like to be a part of our production team or of our worship team, I would love to meet you. Uh, I think there's a card you can fill out and, and drop off out front so I can get in touch with you that way, or I'll be out front at the end of the service if you want to just meet me, shake my hand, and give me your information so we can get in touch, whether it be running the lights or running the screens, uh, which is a learnable process. We can teach you. We would love to have you get involved, or if you can sing or play an instrument, we'd love to have you be a part of our worship team as well. So connect with me. I look forward to meeting you, and hopefully you can be a part of what God's going to do here. Yeah. Let me pray for you guys and uh, just say, hey, I am excited that you guys are here. Look forward to the next season together. God, uh, grateful for how you lead us. I'm grateful for uh, the pathway that's connected um, Trevor and Taylor and Finley with Venture Church. And I pray, Father, that you would just give them the greatest season here of leading us. Lord, that um, we look back years from now uh, that said, this is the time that we built on the foundation that's been here and created a culture of worship, God, that, that honors you above all and that engages this world um, in a way that leads them to you. So I pray, Father, that you would bless them. I pray that you give them the understanding and the insight to lead well here. I pray, Father, that you give them the faithfulness and the tenacity that it takes to lead a spiritual movement. I pray, Father, that you would surround them with people in this room right now that aren't involved. God, that they would step in um, with them and work beside them, and grow, and learn, and lead together. We love you, God. We're grateful for the plans that you have for us, and we just celebrate them now, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Hey, you uh, hopefully got one of these cards on the way in, and it's kind of just a follow-up from last week, because last week I told everybody, if you weren't here, I told everybody, hey, you need to suck it up. Like a good trainer tells you to suck it up, because he knows that he you got more in you than that. And if you just suck it up and push it, then you'll prove it to yourself. But sometimes you need somebody to say, hey, suck it up. So this is the suck it up card. And maybe we'll name it that next time. All right? Serve, okay? Step in. We want you to sit one and serve one, okay? Sit one, serve one. Being a part of church here, being part of the Venture family means sitting one and serving one. And when we do that, we've got more than enough servants for what's needed here, okay? I give you an, I give you an out on that because you can sit one and come early and, and set up or sit one and stay late and tear down, okay? But it's part of it, okay? So serve. When we serve, we stretch ourselves and we push ourselves beyond what we think we're capable of. And listen, we come alive as well. So put your name, email, circle one or two or three, okay? And hey, if you were here months ago when I did this talk about the difference between volunteering and serving and being a servant, then you don't have to circle one. You can just write servant across the card and we'll know that, hey, I'm just willing to be wherever I'm needed. Okay? So that's what this is. All right? So fill this out. Put in the boxes in the back. Drop it off at the info table get involved, okay? Here's what I know about you. You, um, if you are just new here or you're 
been here for, I don't know, you know, a few months, uh, one of a few things is going to happen, all right? One, you are um, either going to step in and start serving and get involved in some relationships. Um, the two greatest ways to do that is through serving or through missional families, okay? It's kind of our big routes of stepping in together and doing that. And you'll start to build some connections that make a difference in your life to where showing up on Sunday is kind of like reuniting with family. Or you're going to stay like just here every once in a while, and then in a few months you're going to kind of be like, I'm not sure where I go. I don't even know anybody there. And then you're going to say in your own mind, that church doesn't know how to connect people. And I'm not connecting anybody. And, and sooner or later you'll filter out and you'll stop coming. I don't want you to stop coming. I also don't want this to not feel like family. And so that, that's where you have to step in. That's where you have to get over a few things and get over like some tendencies to you know, not be too committed and just stay around on the sides and dive in, okay? Or, or you're going to grow up and your kids are going to grow up thinking that the church is just here to consume. The church is just here to serve me. And the more convenient it is for me, the more I'll participate. But once it, once it requires something of me, then I'm out. And that's not, how, that's not even how church is designed. You know, in family, like everybody's got some responsibilities. And sometimes we slack on the responsibilities. Like yesterday, I got tired of the cups sitting around our house, everywhere around our house, Okay. We have eight kids, and so and they have friends, some of them, most of them. <laughs> and they come over, and I'm like, you know, uh, I literally sent a text. Family group, hey, pick your crap up, all right? I, I think I used that word. I, cups, get them up, all right? And throw them away. It's not that hard, okay? And I said, preferably throw them away outside, because They'll, they'll take their trash and they'll just set it beside the trash can that's full. I'm sure it's only my kids that do that. And there's no adults that would ever do that. Because we can't, like, take the trash out. I'm like, no. Like, suck it up. It's not that hard. Like, you got to do this, okay? And it's kind of had a little reset, a little, little come to Jesus text, you know, with our family. And uh, that went out yesterday. Why? Because everybody's got family response. This is a big family. Okay, And it's not all up to grandma to cook Thanksgiving dinner every Sunday so that you just get and just enjoy the feast and then go home. It's not Thanksgiving, okay? This is family. Step in with us, serve with us, be a part of family, okay? Because that's how we roll here, okay? So sit one, serve one. Step in, okay? I'm going to push you, and when you push back, I'm going to tell you what? That's right, all right? And you're going to say, oh, that, that, that's positive. Great. Awesome. <sighs> I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. Okay. Let me pray for us as we uh, kind of step on. God, I pray, God, that you would build a deep sense of family here. I, uh, I sense and feel the plans that you have for us in the future. I know what that's going to require of this family to join you in your mission in Harrisburg. And I pray, Father, that as we step into all that you have planned for us, God, that you would challenge us, that there would be those times where we would hear a loving suck it up from each other, and we would know the love and the care behind it. And I pray, Father, that you would get us ready for these plans. And Father, as you do it, we'll trust you with each step as you open doors, we'll step through them. As you call us to wait, we'll wait. And ultimately, Lord, not just the destination, Lord, but the journey each day with you will be our joy. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I told you I had a lot. The last thing I forgot about, and then I'm going to get on to the message, is we're our uh, Harrisburg crisis assistants, they're short on soup. And uh, I was informed of that on Monday. And so um, I know some of you weren't prepped to bring soup, okay? But 
it's this Sunday and next Sunday. We're doing Super Super Bowl, all right? Because, listen, the game's going to be so bad that you're going to say, I'm going to celebrate Super Bowl Sunday by helping people who need food, okay? And I'm going to bring soup. Large cans, small cans. Uh, some of you did it today. Thank you. Some of you are cleaning out your pantry, all right? Just check the expiration dates before you bring that, okay? Because my kids, every once in a while, I was like, look, this is from 2010. All right. Oh, yeah. Probably need to get rid of that cream of nothing soup that you're never going to eat. Okay. Don't do that. Go out and, uh, I mean, if it's not expired, then by all means bring it. But um, jump in with us, okay? So let's, uh, let's fill up a car or a truck next week, all right? Got it? Good. Every commercial for the Super Bowl, it needs to remind you to bring soup, okay? From, that's your reminder, all right, next Sunday. Hey, we're continuing a series called Get Fit, Training in Godliness. And last week, we kind of had this suck it up day of, you know, when, when, when you have a good trainer that's pushing you physically, they know that they need to push you to failure, push you to exhaustion, because they need to... You know, the harder you go, the more your muscles break down, the stronger you get. And so we know our minds play games with us, and we say, they, you know, no, you can't go anymore. No, you can't. And we need a voice in our lives that says, hey, suck it up. Don't listen to your own thinking. All right? Don't listen to your own way of thinking. And you need to suck it up and do it because you can. And ultimately, when we listen to those voices, we get stronger, and we are better, and so we know we need to suck it, suck it up. Today is different, radically different, because there's something that's also really, really true about getting stronger, and it's something that we don't think about a lot, but it's true physically. If you are in the workout mode, if you are you know, on the fitness train, here's what's true. You don't get strong doing a workout. You don't get strong doing a workout. You only get strong when you recover from a workout. Like during a workout, you're, you're getting weaker. You're breaking your muscle down. You're breaking your body down. Strength is not built during the, week, during the workout. Strength is built when you rest and recover from that workout. And that's the reality of fitness. It's also the reality of training yourself in godliness. It's also the reality of your spiritual life and spiritual health, okay? Because here's what Paul says in Timothy. He just says, hey, physical exercise, it's a really good thing. It has benefits for this life. But spiritual exercise has benefits for this life and the life to come. Okay, so he's saying there's some really good principles about physical exercise that are great, and you should do them, and it'll help you in this life. But there's some of those principles that if you just take them over and apply them to the spiritual life, they work, and they provide benefits not just for this life, but for the life to come as well. So here's one of these principles. You don't get stronger spiritually by doing spiritual stuff. You only get stronger when you recover from spiritual stuff, all right? Uh, the title today is Tapping Out. Tapping out is the key to staying in. Because I hear a lot of people about burnout, and I, I get burned out, and I think sometimes that's real because people go way too hard for way too long. But I think sometimes it's also just an excuse to say, you know, hey, I'm burned out, and nobody's going to question that because, you know, it's just challenging to question somebody who's saying burned out. You're not burned out. You need to suck it up. <laughs> but sometimes you got to rest. And listen, I want you in for the long haul. I'm not in for the next, you know, four-week sprint. I'm not even in for the next year. I want you radically engaging a world that God loves desperately. I want you radically involved in every plan that God has for your life. But in order to stay engaged and stay involved, okay, you are going to have to tap out. Because tapping out is the key to staying in. This is how we um, kind of draw this up on our, on our shapes. And um, 
I don't think I'm up, but maybe I am. Um, yeah, there we go. I've, wrote, I've drawn the circle many times, this semicircle, all right? Because we want to shape our life to look like Christ. And uh, so on the circle, we talk about repentance and belief. And if all this is confusing to you, we have huddle groups that kind of work our way through these shapes because they shape us spiritually. And they're just good tools that help us understand spiritual concepts and engage them in our daily life. So that's the circle. This is a semicircle. And what this mimics or illustrates is this pendulum swing on a clock, on an old school like grandfather clock. And you have this pendulum that drives and tells you the time because it works on a pendulum swing, all right? And it's over here, and then it's over here, and the momentum comes back over here, and it goes back and forth. And what we're doing here is we're doing work over here, and that leads to rest over here. We call it work-rest balance or work-rest rhythm because we want to help you step into this rhythm that God has planned for your life. Because why? I want you in it for the long haul. I mean, I'm walking alongside of people today that I've been walking alongside for 17 years here at this church. And that's amazing. And most of those that are in it for the long haul have engaged some sort of rhythm. And I've also grieved those who have had to tap out for good. Because somehow they weren't engaged in this rhythm of saying, hey, I'm in and then I got to be out. Uh, Other times we used to, like years ago, we used to talk about it as radical engagement. Because we want to love loud. Our kind of theme here is like love loud, risk often, hope always. I mean, those are big ideas. Like if you want to love loud, love in a way that makes a difference, love in a way that says, wow, I feel love. But you know, like, like big love, okay, that takes effort. If you want to risk, I mean, just ri- like when you want to risk often, over and over and over again, risk. Like that's work. And if you want to like an enduring hope that leads you, like those are big ideas. If you want to do that, it's going to require you to not just, you know, tiptoe in. Those are jump in ideas. It's radical engagement to to love somebody, to believe something for somebody, to hope something for somebody, and to hope that God involves you and engages you in the process. That's radical engagement. And we need those periods of radical engagement. But we also need... Radical withdrawal. Radical withdrawal. There's got to be times where we just tap out. Where do we get this pattern from? Well, ultimately we get it from Jesus, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Because I want to dive through some of the passages here that I want to cover this morning. Genesis chapter 2. Here we go. On the seventh day, God had finished His work of creation. So he's finished with his work in six days. Seventh day, he rested from all his work. Great question. Did God need to rest? Okay, we'll just let that sit. Did God need to rest? Just think about it for a bit. So six days he works. Seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. Listen, this is the very first thing that God declares of all of his creation, of all his work. He he declares it holy. What does it mean to be holy? Literally, the word means to be set apart. I'm going to set this apart for God. That's what it means to be holy. I'm set apart for God. So he doesn't do that in all of his creation. But for this, this is the first time he says, I'm going to set this day, I'm going to rest for this day, and I'm going to set, I'm declaring it to be holy, set apart. Because it's the day he rested from all of his work of creation. So what is it? The reason is, this is what God did, so it's holy. And it's holy for us to do. All right? Then you don't read about Sabbath 
for the rest of the book of Genesis. And you get into the next book, Exodus, and you still don't read about it for a while because then, then comes this instance. So the people of Israel, they've been enslaved. First of all, they went down to Egypt, and that was a good thing because famine. They had food there and the story of Joseph and all that. And then they get enslaved there. And so for 400 years, they're enslaved in Egypt. Now, if anybody's been anywhere for 400 years, you understand that that's all you know at that point. That's all your father knew. That's all your grandfather knew. That's all your great-grandfather knew. All they knew is slavery. What's a part of slavery? Work. What's a part of slavery work-wise? Every day. There is no day that's different. You're a slave. You don't get to choose. The funny thing is that some of you have the opportunity to choose and you still choose to be enslaved. So here's this group of people, all they've known is slavery, seven days a week. And then God rescues them, He delivers them, all right? And they they had a little problem with even as Moses is delivering them, you know, part of the problem is they had a quota to meet every day of how many bricks they would, and one of the punishments that Pharaoh, you know, decreed to everybody because he was frustrated with Moses is now I'm going to double what you're supposed to. So you, you had to make 10. Now you got to make 20 every day. So they're coming out of this day in, day out, work, 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 work. And then God rescues them. And now they're wandering in the wilderness and God chooses to feed them every day by manna. Okay. And it's this bread like honey wafer substance of some sort that was on the ground every day and they just went out and picked up bites to eat and they collected enough for the day. And then some of them, because they were pretty industrious, they are like, hey, I'm just not going to just collect enough for today. I'm going to get some for tomorrow too. And they started doing that. And when they did that, they woke up after that next day and what they had collected the day before, it spoiled. It said it was filled with maggots and it smelled awful. Real appealing, right? And God's like, hey, You don't have to do that. It's going to be there every day. And if you try to do that, if you try to get ahead, if you try to be industrious, okay, it's going to spoil. So that's the reality. Now that's where we pick up the story. So in Exodus chapter 16, so he told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today. And set aside what's left for tomorrow. You remember, they've tried this. It didn't work. It spoiled. So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome, good, without maggots or odor. That's a good thing. Something happened. God causes something to happen in this moment that doesn't happen on other days. When we honor Him, He's saying this is holy day. When we honor Him, He causes something that doesn't happen on other days for these guys that happens on this day. God wants them to rest. And so I'm going to provide all you need, not just for today, but tomorrow. So the sixth day, I'll give you more. And now it's going to work for the seventh day so you don't have to go out and harvest it. Now listen, you tell me. If you're an Israelite, coming out of slavery, working every day, okay? What does this sound like to you? I mean, is it, a, is it an obligation? Is it a duty? Is it a new rule coming down? Do this or else. What is it? I mean, if I'm... If I'm having to scratch out every day, claw out every day, and all of a sudden God reminds me, hey, this is how I created you, and I'm going to supply what's needed for that day so that you can have a day of rest, what is that? That's a gift. And they understood it to be a gift. So let's pick up the story. So eat this food today for today. Um, For today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. 
You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. There'll be no food on the ground that day. And what do people do? Some of the people went out anyway. That is so surprising to me. Just kidding. <laughs> Some of you have the full capacity, the full ability to tap out for a day. But you don't. Why is that? Why? I mean, like, this is, this is like challenging the greatest American virtue. Like, it's almost honorable, almost in every segment of our society, to work yourself to exhaustion. Like, wow, like you get praised for that. You get promotions for that. You get rewards for that. You get bonuses for that. And that's what we're striving after. You get, you get some of you um, who have chosen to be in, in situations where you're not in the workforce publicly, but you're either working at home or taking care of family and all that. Even that, you feel like, wow, I got to be, I got to be more. I got to do more. And, they, and it's almost like you double up on what you feel like you have to do to be um, accepted or to be praised or to be valued in this society. Because you don't have a, a paycheck from a, a company. And even in our, with our spiritual leaders, like I've heard spiritual leaders like confess on this, like, um, <laughs> like yeah, I'm really bad at this. And I'm like, you're not going to challenge? I listen to them, and, and it's, it's like a backwards brag. I'm really bad at this commandment. I mean, would we say that? Like, I'm really bad at that adultery commandment. And expect to get away with it? I mean, some people do, but those are really bad cultures. Okay. Well, you know, I'm really bad with this truth thing. I just lie. I just, you know, just have a hard time with it. I mean, I do it seven days a week. Really? Like you going? But but with this, somehow spiritual leaders get away with bragging about disobeying this and get more credit for it. Like that. You see how wrong this is? And look, like you have a choice now because I know I feel some of you struggling. Like, oh gosh, here we go. You know, this legalistic. Like, here's what you know has to listen. Like you can choose to see it as duty. You can choose to see it as legalistic rules. Or you can choose to see it for what it is. It is God's gift to you. So they went out on the seventh day, but what that? They found no food. The Lord asked Moses, How long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instruction? They must realize that the Sabbath day is the Lord's gift to you. There it is. It's a gift. Will you just accept it? That's why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day. So there will be enough for two days. On the seventh day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out and pick up food on the seventh day. All right, some of you are like, you're arguing with me. Like, yeah, that's great. That, that example was like a one-time thing. Several thousand years ago, people of Israel, today's different. You know it, David. I know it, David. You're right. Today is really, really different. I mean, I can't even fathom in today's world like creating a company, you know, like where you'd be open like six days and, and like on Sunday you wouldn't open and like be successful in any form or fashion. I can't even fathom that. I can't even imagine that a, a city like Harrisburg would be raving mad trying to have one of those businesses in our community for Christ's sake. Because why would we want such an unsuccessful, unprofitable idea to invade our American dream world? I mean, that's just several thousand years ago, Dave. It doesn't, doesn't compare to today. You're right. 
except for when Chick-fil-A opens <laughs> in Harris Square. That's reliable insider information that I just shared with you. You'll know that we have arrived. <laughs> but not on Sundays. And there'll be a Sunday where you, re you drive here and you're like, oh, just pull in and get Chick-fil-A. Oh, man. Stupid people. Whoever thought of that idea? I mean, part of my Sabbath is having Chick-fil-A on Sunday. Don't they know that? You know? I mean, like, it's a, okay, so we're way off here. But, like, you get the idea, right? Hey, think about this for a second. I just read this this week. You know what happened in Atlanta, the new stadium, Mercedes? I went to the first football game there. It was the University of Tennessee. Thank you very much. It was a victory, by the way, over Georgia Tech. We celebrate those because there was only about two or three of them this year that happened. All right? But we're on a new path, all right? And um, we were there at that game. First football game in the Mercedes, whatever it's called, Mercedes Dome. Brand new stadium. But they started something new there with all of their concessions, right? Do you hear this? Like, like they started like normal prices for all of their food. Like the owner, Arthur, whoever, said, listen, you're not coming in. Whatever you charge in your restaurant, you're charging here. That's it. We're not doing this gouging stuff anymore, okay? And I just read a report on that, that their... Um, their concession sales were up 17% off last year. Like profits, not just like, okay. And on top of that, in the mix of that, Chick-fil-A's in there. I mean, it's in Atlanta, right? Chick-fil-A can't be in a new stadium, can't not be there. And then I thought, wait a minute, what are their biggest events? It's Falcons game. When do Falcons games mostly happen? On Sunday. Chick-fil-A's closed on Sunday. And they're still profitable in that stadium. In fact, the report said that they were the most profitable vendor. How does that happen? <laughs> the most profitable vendor in the new Atlanta stadium, which the biggest events only happen on Sundays, is Chick-fil-A and it's closed on Sunday. I don't know. But I got a good idea. You see, like, it's just, this is, this is like, you, like, this is evidence of faith. This is where you can say, you can believe this way, or you can just, yeah, I don't know, whatever. You can try to explain it away, but here it is. Like, when you tap out, you get to stay in. When you, like, Step into how God has planned. There's something that happens. I can't explain it. But there's something that God wants to do for you if you will take a day and rest. Tap out. You're, you're built for this. You're designed for this. And that's what he's telling people. So the, the commandment in Exodus 20, remember to observe the Sabbath day. It's the fourth commandment. Keep it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord, your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. I mean, your kids, don't get them started on this, right? Because every day will all of a sudden be the Sabbath day. Sorry, I can't do that. It's my Sabbath. It's my Sabbath. Well, great. Okay. Because we're going to have a few six days here in a second, all right? For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. It's a gift if you want it, but you've got to open it. Man, we really want to work all the time. The funny thing is, this commandment, it not only institutes rest, it commands work. Six days, get after it. Six days, suck it up. Six days, work hard. I mean, if you really want to think about it in our American mindset, like, we're on a five-day work week. 
And the more, quote, progressive the world gets, you know, supposedly the more progressive countries, they're on four-day work week. And some of you enjoy that four-day work week. You can work like 10, you know, four tens or four twelves, and, you know, you get, you get off. And that's great because then you have three-day. And so, um, but we're on like a five-day work week, and God's saying, no, 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 work week is six days, and it's one day out. And I'm thinking, like, we can do this, people. We can do this. Now, listen, I'm not all stuck on Sunday being the day. I think there's some things about Sunday that you could consider. For me and for the staff, I'm like, listen, like, my day off is, my Sabbath is Friday. Because today's a good work day for me. And, um, and then Monday through Thursday. But Friday, like, I, I, don't, I don't do much. Okay. And uh, it's funny because about two weeks ago, we got a lot of new staff, and um, <laughs> it was Friday, and I was at, at lunch with Mindy because that's our normal date is uh, lunch on Fridays. We rarely miss it. And heading to lunch, like by lunchtime, I had four texts from different staff and one phone call. And I'm like, oh, like I probably need to cover this. Like, like you're not going to get a response from me on Friday. <laughs> like you're not. I mean, it would have to be really dire to, to like, get a response out of me on Friday. Because it's tap-out day for me. It just is. And what I do, I focus on my covenant relationships. My relationship with God, it's special. It's covenant. My relationship with my wife, it's special. It's covenant. And, and that's really my focus. Getting some rest physically. So that's how this is. So here's, here's what we know, okay? We know this spiritually. I mean, we know this physically. You get stronger, not when you work out. You get stronger when, when you rest. Listen, guys, it's true spiritually. Some of you want to get stronger spiritually, but you don't want to discipline yourself to this pattern. All right? Here's one, here's one reason, okay? Here's the reasons from the spiritual side. It's, it's this, this thing called Sabbath. It's a reminder of God's covenant relationship. It's a privileged relationship with you and Him. In, in the garden, it's, it's that. We're going to rest. The interesting thing is God rested after six days of work. But He created Adam and Eve on the sixth day. And then he says rest. So for Adam and Eve's reality, what's, what's their first day alive? It's a rest day. You thought about that? And I can think, we can talk, I've talked about this before, but like I think God's intent for us isn't to rest from our exhaustive work. He's actually asking us and inviting us with the gift of rest to actually work from a place of rest. And I know that's a little tricky thing, and that's not just a little, you know, mind game. But it's different when your rhythm is exhaust, collapse, exhaust, collapse, exhaust, collapse. It's different that from rest, engage. Rest, engage. Because here I'm working from a place of rest. On the other I'm kind of exhausted and grumpy all the time. It's just a little different. For Adam and Eve, their first day of reality was a day of rest. And then they worked for the next six days. It's a reminder of God's covenant relationship, and it's living out of the gift of a relationship with Him. It's saying, like, this is a gift. I'm going to cherish it. I'm going to, I'm going to engage it in a rhythm. And there's going to be some extra engagement on this day, where I remember that this is the pattern that God has for me. The second thing is it's a day when God himself is refreshed, and he wants you to be refreshed as well. Does God need to rest out of his work? Does he get exhausted? No. Okay? Let's answer your question, if you're still feeling that tension. All right? He doesn't need rest, but he does get refreshed from this Sabbath day, because he engages us, and we engage him. And it's something that's holy. So this is the reason that we don't rest real quick, okay? Distrust. 
we just, we don't trust that God's going to get this done. We don't trust that God's going to do his magic. All right, whatever that is, fill in the gap, all that. We, so we got to do it ourselves. okay? And I've heard all the excuses because I've said all the excuses. And I've worked this out enough to know that when we get in discipling relationships, like you'll go with me, all right, on repent and believe. You'll go with me on the prayer life and the prayer circle. You'll even go with me in engaging up in and out rhythms. You'll go with me on these places. One place that I can't get some of you to go is to go with me on a work rest balance. You won't do it. It's the hardest rhythm to get you to do, and yet it's the greatest gift that God has for you. It's, it's, it, it, it doesn't make sense, but it is because I see it. I see it when I try to come up against your schedule, your priorities, what you want to do. You just don't trust. You have distrust. Some of you, that goes deeper than any schedule thing, honestly. I mean, this is real deep right here. Because some of you, your whole identity is built on getting stuff done. You are a doer. And you can't fathom, like you, you lose yourself if you tap out. You lose yourself when you say, the world's going to function without me. You don't even want to test that theory. You're afraid it might be right. Everybody needs me. And you, a day where you are not needed and everything happens would terrify you. Because you are a human doing instead of a human being. And your identity is wrapped up in your accomplishment rather than your identity in a covenant relationship with a perfect heavenly father who loves you, who has all the hairs of your head numbered. He knows your days. He collects your tears in a bottle. Come on. He's a good father. And he knows how to give good gifts to his kids. And his identity that he wants to give to us is sons and daughters. Man, I don't want my kids stressed out over what they're going to eat tomorrow. I mean, sometimes they'll freak out and I'll be like, hey, buddy, it's snack dinner night. You know what that means? Whatever you want it to mean. Because <laughs> what ultimately it means is we're not doing anything. Just tap out. Listen, some of you have your identity in, in, in accomplishment, in doing. And that's why this is so hard. And I'm not pretending that that's easy to overcome, okay? But it is a gift that God's inviting you in and saying, please, trust me, take your rest. It's distrust. Second thing is dissatisfaction. Some of you just don't have your satisfaction in God, and so you've got to create satisfaction. And so that's why you work yourself to the bone. That's why your hobbies are just ridiculous, okay? Like they, you work harder at your hobbies than you do at your work. That's why stuff that should be fun is not fun. Because you're not satisfied, and you've got to get something out of this rather than engaging it for some of you like vacation like, like you work harder on vacation than you work like rest just rest dissatisfied third thing some of you just aren't interested it's like I've created my spiritual world without it and that's fine but it doesn't work out in the physical world I mean just do bicep curls every day this week for 15 minutes every day. You're never going to get stronger because you're not given time to get stronger. And then some of you, it's just difficult. It is. 
Like it's planning. Saying, hey, I, like, it's saying, hey, I'm not going to do that. I don't respond to that. I'm just out. I'm closing with these two things because Jesus says a lot about this, okay? This is, this is how Jesus does this. Because here, here's what we want. Let me get a new page here. Or let me erase all this. No, I can't erase all that. All right, I'll just draw it down here. Because here's what we do. We, we, we talk about Jesus' um, words all the time. That's not an apostrophe. All right. Sorry. Jesus' words. That's what we center on here. This is what Jesus said. And then we think, okay, let's just go out and let's do you know, Jesus' works. So let's hear what Jesus had to say. Let's go do what he did. Right? That's what, I mean, some churches just stop at words. You know we're not that place. But then some churches say, hey, let's go do what Jesus did. And then you get out there and you try it and it doesn't work quite as well. And the reason it doesn't work quite as well is because we don't examine Jesus' ways. See, the pathway is this. It's listening to Jesus' words. It's imitating his ways. And then we go out and do what he did. Love a world. Bring healing to the broken. Freedom to captives. It's, it's all of that. But listen, Jesus' pattern is this. Like, he's radically engaged. There's times when the disciples describe, hey, we didn't even have time to eat. We were so busy in ministry. We are so busy in radical engagement. The crowd's pressing in on us. And then it's like, and then we like, where's Jesus? And he's gone. And he's praying all night to his Father. And he's spending time in a covenant relationship. Or he's resting. He's asleep. When everybody else is freaking out, Jesus is not freaking out. And that bothers us in America. He's asleep in a boat when everybody needs him. This is his way. And so he says this in, um, in John, I mean, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 11. He invites you into his rest. Okay? Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. A give. It's a gift. I'll, you come to me for this gift, and I'll give it to you. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Listen, I've shared this verse with hundreds and hundreds of people. One of the most powerful like, things that I've heard about this verse, if you haven't seen Brian Welsh's video, I Am Second, go to IamSecond.com, watch this Brian Welsh video. He used to be the lead guitarist in Korn, the band, and in the middle of that, it's his story. And it's somebody shared this verse with him, and he says, well, I'm tired, I'm weary, I need rest for my soul. I've shared this verse hundreds of times because it's so powerful to, to like weary people. Because God's saying, here's, Jesus is saying, I'm inviting you in. It's my gift. Rest. And that's all I've ever seen it as. But, but maybe, maybe Jesus is inviting you to something else here. Because it feels like he's inviting you into rest. And what? Relief. But maybe he's not. Because if you put two and two together here, when do we get stronger? When we rest, when we recover. So, so maybe Jesus' invitation isn't, hey, come and rest. It's like, hey, come get stronger. Come get stronger. Maybe we don't need a workout coach because most of you need a rest coach. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, come to me. Let me teach you how to get stronger. 
Let me teach you what rest looks like. It's his invitation. The last thing is Jesus promises his production. Okay? Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Everybody understands the, the vine is here. Jesus said, hey, I'm the vine, you guys are the branches. The vine, fruit doesn't grow off the vine. Fruit grows off the branches. Branches don't produce fruit on the, themselves. They have to be connected. This connection is an abiding relationship. It's time together. It's enjoying a special relationship. When we talk about work-rest balance, we're talking about work as work, production. We're talking about rest, abiding. It's a pendulum swing. You can't have one without the other. And that's God's promise to you. It's also his invitation to you. And most importantly, guys, don't leave here without knowing this. It is his gift. It's to be understood as a gift, not as a duty. It's to be understood from your creator who made you, fabricated you, produced you, wired you, and knows how you're designed for maximum production. And this is how he's designed you. Step into it. This is our rhythm here. This is the rhythm that we want to invite you into. And I trust that God's spirit will lead you to, to accept a gift of rest. Rest. Somebody said on the way in, like, hey, if today's about a nap, I'm in. Well, here it is, okay? Here it is. You pray with me? God, um, thank you for this gift. I know um, the enemy wants to twist it into all kinds of junk that's not true. But I pray this morning we push all that crap out and that we simply would, would see you as a perfect heavenly father, so caring and so loving, inviting us to just rest and structuring the rhythms of our life around that place of abiding with you, of resting in you and getting stronger in those moments. Pray that you'd build us the strength of our church through this process, God. And help us to be a place where, like Chick-fil-A, people would marvel, like, how do you get that much done? And we can point not just to your words and your works, but your ways. And we would step into them. May it be true of it, all of us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.